In the JP Morgan annual letter to shareholders, Jamie Dimon, the CEO, blamed regulators for the recent banking panics that we've seen and warned that the current crisis is not yet over and that there will be repercussions from it for years to come. He argues that the recent events where three US banks failed and the Swiss government engineered an emergency takeover of Credit Suisse risk undermining confidence in the banking industry and prompted investors to price in a greater risk of recession in the United States. In his letter, he put forth that the regulations ushered in after the credit crunch encouraged banks to build large portfolios of treasury bonds that then fell in value when the Federal Reserve raised interest rates, leaving certain banks nursing losses that spooked investors. Ironically, banks were incented to own very safe government securities because they were considered highly liquid by regulators and carried very low capital requirements, he wrote in the letter published earlier this week. Diamond took aim at banking stress tests in his letter too. Stress testing is the annual process run by the Fed to gauge the biggest bank's ability to withstand major economic shocks. He said in his letter, that the exercise has become an enormous, mind-numbingly complex task about crossing T's and dotting I's that might give a risk committee a false sense of security. He says that even worse, the stress testing based on the scenario devised by the Fed never incorporated interest rates at higher levels. He says that he's not aiming to absolve bank management. He just wanted to make clear that this wasn't the finest hour for many players. All of the colliding factors became critically important when the marketplace rating agencies and depositors began focusing on them. A less academic, more collaborative reflection on possible risks that a bank faces would better inform institutions and their regulators about the full landscape of potential risks, according to Diamond. Diamond pointed out that many of the risks, including a sharp rise in interest rates, had been hiding in plain sight. He criticized regulators for not considering such an obvious risk in tests that were supposed to test bank stability. This is all true and seems to be a type of mistake that both investors and regulators make over and over again. They often miss bigger, more structural problems because they focus on the last crisis as if it will repeat itself exactly. Patrick Honaghan, the former governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, told the press recently that interest rate risks flew under the supervisory system's radar, so much so that the Fed's recent bank stress tests used scenarios with little variation and none examined higher interest rates, even in a cycle of rising rates, because the credit crunch had left investors obsessively worried about credit risk alone. Interest rate risk became downplayed, probably because it hadn't caused problems since 1994. Some of what Jamie Dimon says in his letter reflects a growing fear among banking executives that the collapse of these banks will lead to a toughening up of regulations beyond what might make sense. Dimon cautions that erratic stress test capital requirements and constant uncertainty around future regulations damages the banking system without making it safer. Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank were, of course, exempt from most of the toughest regulatory measures that banks in the developed world have to deal with, including stress tests, because they had less than $250 billion in assets. This exemption, it's been argued, came as a result of significant lobbying by community banks in the United States. So could this panic have been prevented? Well, before I get into that, let me tell you about today's video sponsor, Surfshark. 
I've been using VPN software like Surfshark for quite some time as I travel a lot and data security is really important to me. Surfshark is an easy to use and affordable VPN app for Windows, Mac, Android, iOS and more. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network and what it means is that when you use it all of your internet traffic goes through a secure tunnel and your data is encrypted making it much safer if you want to log into your bank or brokerage account from a coffee shop or an airport lounge. Surfshark is not just a great way to protect your data, but you'll also find that if you log into services like Netflix from different countries, different films are available. Surfshark is fast, reliable, and they don't collect or track your data. Get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deals forward slash boil. Enter promo code BOIL for 83% off and three extra months free. You can share the subscription with up to seven different people, making it really very cheap. There's also a 30-day money-back guarantee. Click the link in the description to sign up today. Okay, so could this panic have been prevented? Well, the Federal Reserve tightened its oversight of big Wall Street banks in response to the 2008 financial crisis. And I think this made sense. If the government is providing a free put option to banks that are considered too big to fail, it makes sense for them to dampen down the volatility of those banks to reduce the risks that they're taking. Barney Frank, whose name was on the Dodd-Frank Act that overhauled financial regulation in the aftermath of the credit crunch, went on to take a board seat at Signature Bank, one of the banks that failed after he left Congress. While Frank never officially registered as a lobbyist, he made numerous public speeches that the Dodd-Frank Act's $50 billion threshold for triggering greater regulatory oversight was too low. In response to lobbying, US regulators in 2018 raised the threshold for a financial institution to be considered systemically important to $250 billion. This exempted much larger banks from the Fed's toughest supervisory measures, including stress tests as well as capital and liquidity requirements. It's worth noting that bank failures are not actually that uncommon. According to the FDIC, there were 563 bank failures between 2001 and 2023. And when the FDIC closes down small banks that are not systemically important, it tends to happen with minimal impact. Often depositors have access to all of their money the next day. Jamie Dimon in his letter urged policymakers to avoid knee-jerk, whack-a-mole or politically motivated responses. He said that the recent turmoil should push regulators to scrutinize risks to banks that arise from having a high proportion of uninsured deposits or an undiversified customer base, which were issues at all three of the US banks that failed last month. We shouldn't aim for a regulatory regime that eliminates all failure, but one that reduces the chance of failure and the odds of contagion, wrote Diamond, who in the past has complained that regulatory requirements disincentivize banks from providing some traditional and important banking activities like mortgage lending. He added that we should carefully study why this particular situation happened and not overreact. Diamond went on to say that higher interest rates can be expected to result in pain for any borrowers who have to refinance their loans, which Diamond said could expose additional weaknesses in the US economy, including in the real estate market. He said that he did not expect the turmoil to lead to a global financial crisis like in 2008, noting that it involved fewer players and fewer issues. In terms of the longer term repercussions, Diamond argued that the recent events had provoked jitters in the market, which were likely to prompt lenders to pull back from making loans in the months ahead, increasing the odds of an economic recession. 
Diamond discussed in his letter how the huge levels of intervention by central banks around the world over the last decade led to extraordinary liquidity that drove increased prices across many investment classes, from financial markets to crypto, meme stocks and real estate amongst others. He pointed out that this liquidity also increased bank deposits significantly and the now famous uninsured deposits, which went from $6 trillion to $8 trillion. What Diamond says in his letter makes a lot of sense. The failure of Silicon Valley Bank was driven by failures of both regulation and banking supervision, along with gross mismanagement. There was an over-reliance on the rules as they are written by regulators and a failure to complete the discretionary oversight that banking supervisors are supposed to be doing. Under the risk-weighted capital rules, treasury securities are risk-weighted to zero, meaning that a bank has to hold zero equity against their treasury positions. Because of this, Silicon Valley Bank was able to build up a lot of interest rate risk without it being reflected in their capital requirement under the regulatory framework. Silicon Valley Bank essentially figured out a way to take additional risk without holding additional capital. There is, of course, a supervisory framework in place designed to be able to deal with the holes in the capital requirement regulations. Up until the 1980s, there were essentially no meaningful capital rules in place, just this discretionary safety and soundness oversight by bank supervisors. Any seasoned supervisor looking at the balance sheet of Silicon Valley Bank would have picked up on the problems immediately. They weren't exactly hidden. Lev Menard of Columbia University argued on the Odd Lots podcast that contemporary supervision is broken because outside of the stress testing framework, supervisors just focus on process and procedures today and are reluctant to make judgments about the actual decisions being made by banks as to the appropriate level of risk. Bank supervisors are allowed to exercise independent judgment under current laws, but they don't tend to do so. Sheila Baer, the former chair of the FDIC, wrote a piece for the FT after the depositor bailout. She said that at combined assets of $300 billion, the two banks represent a minuscule part of the US banking system. She did not agree with the VCs who claimed that letting Silicon Valley Bank go would cause nationwide bank runs, and she cast doubt on the idea that the financial system is so delicate that it couldn't absorb some small haircut on these banks' uninsured deposits. She argued that the uninsured depositors of Silicon Valley Bank were not a needy group requiring special protection, and that while some startups argued that they needed their uninsured deposits to make payroll, under the FDIC's normal procedures, they would have received a sizable payout to help with their cash flow needs the next day when banks opened. She said that signature banks, uninsured depositors, similarly would have probably achieved significant recoveries as both banks have good assets for the FDIC to sell. The banks could have been wound down as they were supposed to be. Janet Yellen, who spent years voicing her concern about income inequality in the United States, rushed to the rescue of careless tech investors whose wealth had ballooned due to low interest rates in recent years. She couldn't allow them to take a haircut on their deposits, possibly for fear that she'd be called out on the All In podcast. Bank runs can be difficult events to predict or even understand. There's an anecdote from the early 1980s of a local bank in Hong Kong which had an awning over its front window to block the sun on hot days and keep the bank branch cool. The office was near a bus stop, and on a very rainy day, the people waiting for the bus moved to take shelter under the awning. Passers-by thought that the crowd outside the door was the start of a bank run and so joined them. As a result, a bank run quickly developed. The panic at Silicon Valley Bank highlighted 
how the Federal Reserve is not set up to deal with the speed of online consumer behavior. People no longer have to stand in line to move their money in the era of banking apps. A striking feature about the American banking system, even before the March panic, was that bank customers were moving money out of low-paying deposit accounts into better yielding money market funds, or even treasuries, at a dramatically faster rate than at similar points in financial history. Money just moves faster today than it did in the past. The chart on screen shows that as interest rates began rising, bank customers across the country quickly began taking advantage of these new higher rates by moving their money out of bank accounts and into money market accounts. The pace then obviously picks up after the panic. When the run was in full effect, the Silicon Valley bank managers asked the Federal Reserve for help in meeting depositors' claims. But unlike mobile banking apps that their customers were using, the Fed facilities are only open for a few hours each day. Silicon Valley Bank contacted the Fed for help too late in the day, and the window was already closed. There's a good argument for moving central banking processes into the 21st century and keeping them running around the clock in times of crisis, or even just having them match the opening hours of retail banks all the time. An amusing side story to the panic in March was that when Signature Bank of New York was taken into receivership, depositors at other banks across the country panicked too. The reason for this was that there are four banks named Signature Bank in the United States, and customers weren't initially sure which of them was in trouble. The fact that there are so many signature banks shows you how many small banks there are in the United States. At the end of last year, there were almost 5,000 commercial banks in America, which is far more than anywhere else. Canada has fewer banks in total than the state of North Dakota has. Japan has just 4% the number of banks that America has. Because of the differing regulation, the United States has ended up with a two-tier system where the big banks are subject to full supervisory scrutiny and a long list of smaller banks are exempt from the type of regulation that's standard in the rest of the developed world. One point that may be a good thing is that the recent panic ignited some fear in the financial system and has forced both the public and regulators to pay more attention to what's going on. The anxiety created by small shocks can be a good thing if it makes big crises somewhat less likely. If you enjoyed today's video, you should watch my video on Blackstone struggling real estate investment fund next. Don't forget to check out today's video sponsor Surfshark using the link in the description below. See you in the next video. Bye.